Would you please pray with me? Father, we do ask for your blessing. Lord, you have blessed us in Jesus. You have blessed us in Christ, your Son, our Savior. And Father, we want that to be known. Lord, we want that to be known here in this time, here always in Humboldt County, here in every aspect that you've given to us, Lord, to to be a part of. So, Father, please bless uh, your women, Lord, these women today. Lord, bless the the things that you have for me to give to them this morning from your word. Give us a foundation for women's ministries, Father, that you would be exalted, that Christ would be lifted up in all that we do, Father. There is a joy, there is a beauty, there is a glory to be had in the biblical role of women. And so I ask, Father, please, for your guidance in all that we do today, Lord. Please give us the foundation that you have given us in Christ. And, Lord, please be exalted and glorified in all that we do. Please, we ask for your blessing and your spirit to attend to our time. In Jesus' name, amen. If I could have my lovely assistant, Vanna, come down and help me at this time. I have a set of notes I'd like to pass out to you. Um, This comes from seven sermons, and it's a compilation of that. Uh, I have 13 pages. We are not going to get through all these today. Thank you, Vanna, my lovely assistant. Anyway, so uh, on the cover sheet, you'll notice I give, I give recognition to Phil Foley. I have his permission to do this. I do apologize. Um, I, was put, uh, uh, to, I was put to the task of overseeing women's ministry a year and a half ago. Welcome. It's a little late, <laughs> uh, but here we are today. So uh, after talking with Phil, Phil had the same, same thing. He was in charge of women's ministries at Community Bible Church down in Vallejo. And uh, he even said in one of the conferences, he says, this is the area where men, where pastors step away from so much of the time. So much of the time, the pastors, the elders of the church will just step aside from women's ministries because they fear you, okay? A natural fear, but they step aside. And what happens when they do that? Think about this for a second. This is what happened in the garden, Adam stepped aside from his responsibilities, and Eve was tempted by Satan. We're going to cover that today. That's something we need to really focus on, is when men of the church don't hold up to their responsibilities, then the women are left trying to figure out what they're supposed to be doing, and there's there's just this, this void, but it goes back to the garden. Adam was standing right there next to his wife, and he let her eat the fruit. There was a used car salesman in the garden. His name was Satan, and he sold a car to his wife, and she got home with it, and he said, what did you buy? And he said, oh, it's pretty nice. It's got leather, but it's got 7,100 miles on it. Anyway, so one of the issues is, is that usurping of authority and, and that stepping aside and men not holding their position in the church and caring for their wives at home and things like that. So anyway, this is Phil's notes. If you notice, I gave him credit on the very front page there. It's Phil's notes that I've adapted uh, so these are not his complete encompassment. Um, I have modified them and changed them. The theology, I have not changed. I have just modified them to fit our purposes here today and for the women's ministries. Some books, too, that I will like heartily endorse that are in there, too, are these four up here. Actually, this is one I've added. This is The Vine Project. This is how you implement the trellis and the vine. Okay, this is a structured book for discipleship ministries in the church. I would love to see us in home fellowships working through this book and implementing from this book. Okay, so these are some things that we're looking for in the future. But then also Feminine Appeal by Carolyn Mahaney, excellent book. Legan Duncan and Susan White, this is, this is a lot of what you will read in this book. Hopefully you will read this book. It's not very thick. Some of the ladies are doing this right now. It's going to be covered in some of the notes too. So these are the references. You can't have these, sorry. These are mine, (laughs) but you can also uh, buy them. They're rather inexpensive, but they're very, 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 very good. So I want to introduce something to you this morning. Um, You guys look good. You guys dressed up. You guys dressed up, didn't you? Did did everybody put their makeup on this morning? I I did not. I did not. But you ladies, I just want to say, my wife knew I was going to say this, so I'm not being fresh. Okay. You, You ladies look good. You ladies look good. You look beautiful, okay? Now I would like you to open, now I would like you to open up your Bibles. Everybody brought a Bible, right? To 1 Peter chapter 3. And I have these young ladies over here this morning, and I would really like to, this is this first section I really want to focus on young ladies, but you'll see how this applies to all of us, okay? What is attractive? How do we define attractive? How do we define beauty, What is beautiful in the sight of God? What does God say, this is beautiful? This is precious in the sight of God. Okay, because that's what we should be looking for, right? That's what we should be attaining to. When we talk about beauty and women being beautiful in the church, we want to know what God says is beautiful. So so young ladies, here's a little, I'll step down here so I can get my daughter's attention. (laughs) I know this is terrifying, but in the future, there'll be young men who will be looking at you, okay? 
So in the future, in the future, you have to think about what do you want them to be attracted to? In the future, my, my daughter says she's never going to get married, and she's right, she won't. <laughs> but the point, the point is, what are the young men attracted to? What is that young man looking for in a young lady? Is he looking at the outside? Is he looking at the exterior? Or is he looking at what's inside of you? What do you want to make sure that is attractive to him? What do you want to make sure is attractive to the church? What do you want to make sure is attractive outward from inside of you? Let's read this. Let's look at what God says he considers to be attractive. In 1 Peter 3, 1 through 6, I want to read this to you and speak on this just first, first to start off. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that... Even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. Whoa. You're supposed to win them by not saying anything. Does that work, ladies? <laughs> You're all like, no, that doesn't work. Anyway, but that's what God said. He said, look at that. That's what Peter is saying. Inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Peter is saying to us, it says, wives, win them over by the behavior with your behavior. Verse 2. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not merely external braiding of the hair, the wearing of gold jewelry, or putting on dresses. Please do that. We like it when you guys dress up. But it's not merely that. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden person. This is what's attractive to God. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. He doesn't just say it's attractive in a little way. He says it's precious. What do you have that's precious amongst you? Does anyone have a, a diamond ring that your husband gave to you? Is that not precious? Would you even, ta- even consider taking it off? Well, some, some, maybe not. Is there something you have that's precious to you? That's the word here, precious. You wouldn't let it go for anything. Jesus is, God is saying, through Peter, God is saying this to us. He's saying, this is what's precious in my sight. What I look for, what's attractive to me, what I find precious is a gentle and quiet spirit. It's the inner person that God is looking at. Young ladies, if the young man is not looking for that, run or I'll get my shotgun. Because he's a wolf. He's not a shepherd. He's a wolf. Stay away from him. And also, don't try to attract him with something other than that. You shouldn't be trying to attract a young man that's not attracted to that. So you shouldn't be putting anything out there that would not be exemplifying that. This is just a beautiful verse here. This is just beautiful for us. Verse 5. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves being submissive to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Now, I use this for men too, and I tell them, don't count on your wife calling you Lord. It ain't going to happen, okay? So don't expect that to be the case. You're not supposed to call your husband's Lord, right? And there's a little issue of Abraham being a little bit deceptive, right? He's a liar. He involved, he involved Sarah. But Sarah said they adorned themselves. Look at the word there. Look at this. For in this way, in former times, the holy women, holy women, set aside. God is holy, holy, holy. These holy women, these women who wanted to be holy and exemplify God, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, used to wear this around. This was their outer garment. This was what they exuded from their personalities. This is what they put out there to be attractive, being submissive to their own husbands. Wow. We could stop right there, right? You guys all good on that? Ready to leave? No, we have more. There's a battle in the world right now, and it's gotten into the church. There's a battle for your femininity going on. If you haven't noticed, the world wants to destroy the role of women and men in the church. Those distinct roles the world is trying to destroy every single day. Feminism is one of those avenues. Feminism is trying to destroy your femininity. There's a big difference between feminism and femininity. Femininity is something you want to strive after. Feminism is something you want to avoid and you want to do battle with, ladies. Because there is an enemy out there, the devil, who is after you. And it's getting the church. Not just this church. When I say church, I'm not talking about Grace Baptist Church. I'm talking about the church universal. I'm talking about what people call evangelical Christianity of the day. Look at the notes in the introduction. I, um, I'm following along with Phil, and I agree with this. He says, the big picture, what we need to do today is to lay a biblical foundation. So they're on page one, top of the page. 
So my objective is to lay that biblical foundation for you today, for women's ministry, and then from this foundation, determine the objectives and the tasks that we should be doing in women's ministries. So that's what we're trying to do today. I'm not going to address those specifics. Those are things that we're going to deal with in the future. I just want that foundation to be solid. And I'm not saying that the foundation is not here, but I just want to make sure we're clear on what the foundation is, what the battle is, and how we to rightly oppose it. We need to know that there's an enemy coming after us. We need to know that so that we know how to rightly guard against it and fight against it. We've got to know these things in the church. So I want to begin by talking about this and the importance of this. So if you look at the second paragraph there, it says, As you are aware, we live in a culture inundated by feminism. The news tells us that feminism is for women's rights, equality, and fighting against the oppression of women. You're going to read down through this, and they say that marriage is oppression. Think about that for a minute. What is marriage? What is the covenant of marriage to do? It's to display the person and work of Jesus Christ. Is it just the culture that wants to destroy that? No, it's Satan. It was in the very Garden of Eden that he attempted to do that, and he did. He deceived Eve. They ate, and now we're in a mess. He hasn't stopped doing that. That was a picture. Satan rightly understood that Adam and Eve were a picture of Christ. He knew what was there, and he attacked it because it was a visual aspect of God. He hates God. By the way, he hates you too. Continue on with this. It is right that we stand against the injustices done to women. Absolutely true. That's not what's at stake. So on the surface, feminism appears appealing. It is when you start digging around and you find their real agenda. If you look down at the bottom, there's some footnotes down there. You'll see the references down there. This is all footnoted. He found all these, and there's more of them out there. This was five years ago. Imagine there's a plethora now. There was a plethora then. Continue reading. Let me read you some of those goals of feminism as stated by feminists. Feminism is the theory. Lesbianism is the practice. The simple fact is that even women must be willing to be identified as a lesbian to be fully feminine. Now, that's blatant. We would ardently disagree with that. That's blatant. But if it's subtly getting into the church, we know that Satan is at the root of it. So if these things are subtly getting in, we need to make sure that we fight against them. Satan doesn't come knocking at the door saying, hey, you guys are all going to be lesbians. That's not how he's going to do it. He's going to work in small ways, subtle ways. That's just the way he does it. So we have to be ready for that. We have to be guarded. We have to put on the armor of God every single day. We have to be in the word and in prayer every single day. So feminism is not simply fighting for freedoms for women. They want to be free from God's creative order. Anyway, so they do that. Since marriage constitutes, this is the feminist, this is the feminist. Since marriage constitutes slavery for women, it is clear that the women's movement must concentrate on attacking this institution. Freedom for for women cannot be won without the abolition of marriage. We cannot destroy the inequalities between men and women until we destroy marriage. Quotes are down at the bottom, it's footnoted. You can see where that is the agenda for the feminists, the feminists today. Let's forget, another quote, let's forget about the mythical Jesus and look for courage, solace, and inspiration for real women. 2,000 years of patriarchal rule under the shadow of the cross ought to be enough to turn women toward the feminist salvation of the world. Ay, 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 ay. Is that not terrifying? It's like, okay, but that's outside. That's out in the world. We don't have to worry about it. It's not in the church. You guys are in the world. You're not of the world, but you're in the world. We go out there in the world, and these things do rub off on us. Second paragraph. It is clear that the underlying agenda of feminism is to destroy biblical femininity. Ladies, this is a battle for your joy and for Christ's glory. Absolutely. That's where the battle lies, and he's going to attack all of us. He's going to attack you. He's going to attack me. He's going to attack your children. But you have a warrior. You have Christ who clothes you every single day, who's faithful. Is he not faithful? He gives you the armor you need. You have a breastplate of righteousness. That's Christ's righteousness. You have a belt of truth. He is the truth. You have a shield of faith. It's faith in Christ. You have feet prepared with the gospel of peace. I missed the, the, okay, first you get the boots on, then you put the shield on. Now, think about this. a helmet of salvation, which is Christ. Have you guys ever seen some of the movies where they shoot the arrows? Where do those arrows come from? They volley arrows in some of those movies. You guys are looking at me like, I don't know what you're talking about. 
They shoot arrows in the sky and they come down from above on top of you. Most of the time we think of a shield, we're going to put the shield in front of us. We're going to see it coming, right? Guess what? Satan likes the backside of you. Okay, so women, you need to be having someone covering your backside. Chris covers my backside quite frequently. He's good about that. He's in the sound booth. And I ask him, I say, you cover my backside? He goes, I got your back. I need that. I need a plurality of elders at this church. We need each other to cover each other's backside. Because arrows come from every direction. We think of that shield. I've got this shield. I'm ready. I'm ready to stand. And Satan will shoot you right in the back with some subtle thing. Or an arrow will hit you in the top of the head. That's where they're going to come from. So you need to be clothed in the beauty of Christ all over. In Christ. In Christ at all times. Trusting in his faithfulness. Because the arrows will come every way you look at it. A book was released. If you look down that second sentence or third sentence, second paragraph, it says, A book was released some years ago with the title, Jesus Feminist. The author stated that following Jesus made her a feminist. This woman claims to be an evangelical Christian. That's just one avenue into the church, right? So when you're out there reading the books on Amazon and things like that, oh, this looks like a good book? You might want to ask your pastor. You might want to ask another older lady. You might want to find out who wrote the book and who endorsed the book. Can you trust the people out there writing books? There are more snakes in Christian bookstores than you know. There's a lot of them out there. Because this is a Christian woman who said, feminism is a good thing. Look at that, evangelical Christian. She claims to be an evangelical Christian. So you would read the, see the book and say, hey, this might be a good book. Maybe I need to read this. Scary, scary the things that are out there. So let me be very clear. It says, feminism is false teaching that leads to unfulfillment, bondage, heartache, and disappointment. Because it's a lie. The truth is, Jesus tells us, sets us free. Christ is the truth that we need to set us free. Scores, if you look at the quote there from Legan Duncan on the last line, Legan Duncan has noted, and he's the co-author of Women's Ministries in the local church with uh, Susan Hunt, says, scores of evangelical women are functionally feminist because the world's paradigms, the thinking, the mindset for womanhood is only one they have ever heard. So today, I want to change that. You might have only heard that there's one worldview for womanhood. Maybe you've studied some of this. But if we're negligent in the church to do this, then we are negligent to train what is the beautiful picture that these young ladies over here, I hope, will follow. Who gets to train these young ladies besides their moms? You know, most of the time kids don't look at their parents. They look at other people in the church. So all of us are being watched by the younger generation. They're going, oh, is that what it means to be a man? Is that what it means to be a woman? So we need here today, the older ladies in the church, the Titus 2 ladies, need to start thinking, How am I making myself available to the next generation? How am I showing the next generation what's attractive to God, which is a quiet and gentle spirit? Wow. That's what God says is precious in his sight. So precious, he's not going to let that go. That's his. So biblical foundations for women's ministries. The goal is, again, a brief biblical overview on the topics so we can see the big picture from Scripture. The foundation of women's ministry is found in the understanding of how God created mankind. He created man, male and female, equal, yet with distinct roles. Understanding this is the path to fulfillment and joy and bringing glory to God. Would you agree with that statement, ladies? Understanding that we are created equal. Men and women are created equal, but there's a distinction in roles. What was attacked in the garden? What was cursed in the garden? Adam and Eve were not cursed. Their roles were cursed. When you read the account of what happened, her role was cursed. His role was cursed. The ground will now produce nothing but thorns and thistles. She will experience pain in childbirth. The roles were were cursed, not the individuals. Satan was cursed as an individual. He will be crushed. But the roles were what was cursed because the roles were what were attacked by Satan. So the essence of masculinity and femininity, if you look down at point number one, is seen in the differences between male and female, which is introduced in Genesis chapter two. God made the man the head and the woman the helper. Is that okay? They both start with H, so that makes it right. Head and helper. A helper is submissive to the head. The head is the one that's responsible. Remember we talked about those arrows coming down? Who's supposed to stand over you, ladies, if you're married? Your husband. If you step out from underneath that umbrella, there are a lot of arrows coming down. Let him take them. Let him take the arrows. Please, let him take the arrows. That's his job. 
Let him take the arrow. Stand underneath him. Well, I can't because he's not. No, 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 no. God put him there. He's your protection. He's the one covering you. Those arrows won't find you. You stand underneath his protection. If you're not married, young ladies over here at the table, you have a father. If you're a widow, you have the elders of the church. There is a male responsibility within the church, within fathers, and within husbands to watch over the ladies of the church. And the other men of the church, too, are supposed to treat the young ladies like they're sisters, right? Big thing. Point A, men's role. Paul writes, man is the head of woman in, in 1 Colossians, in Colossians, I mean, so Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11.3. Open to 1 Corinthians 11.3. I would like to explain something from that text. How many of you like being submissive? Nobody's raising their hand. We have this on video, so. How many of you like to submit to authority? I don't like to submit to authority. How many of you like to submit? We don't like to submit to authority, do we? I can do things on my own. I can pull myself up. Until we understand that there's a reason for it. If I were to tell you that in your submission you glorify God the Father, would that be enough for you? In your submission... You bring glory to God the Father. Let's start in 11. Let's start in 1. It says, Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. Now I praise you, because you remember me in everything, and hold firmly to the traditions, just as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. Look at that. Not the believing man, but every man, whether they know it or not. Every man. And the man is the head of a woman, his wife, And God is the head of Christ. Wow. We talk about head coverings after that. We don't need to go into that. You you guys can wear a bonnet if you want to church. That's okay. Let's look at this. Who is the head of man? Christ. Who is the head of woman? Who is the head of Christ? God the Father. Let's think about that for a second. Does Christ submit to the Father? Yes, he does. Willingly. Gloriously. Gloriously, he submits to the Father's will. He does what the Father says. He doesn't do his own will. He shut himself off when he came to earth. He does what the Father tells him to do. He does nothing unless the Father says so. Nothing. Read it in the Gospels. Jesus doesn't do anything unless the Father tells him to do it. That's the picture of submission. And then he is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. When you submit to a husband, you're submitting in the same fashion as Christ submits to the Father. Who gets the glory in all of that chain? God the Father does. You're putting yourself under a, under, a, uh, under a hierarchy that is gospel theologically centered. Okay, understand that. God the Father is up here. Christ submits to him. The man submits to Christ. I sure hope so. Every man. And the wife submits to, to her husband. He is the head covering. And who gets the glory? Goes straight up to God. You always want to be submissive? Now you're going, yeah. <laughs> Because God gets the glory, not your husband. Okay? Question? I'll entertain it for five seconds. Go. Okay. Yes. So in in that case, when, so I have have a mother-in-law. You don't submit to your husband if he asks you to sin. If your husband is not, if your husband is not saved, yes. then you have the issue of you submit to him only up to a point. Right. I, I have a mother-in-law who, my father-in-law, remember I talked about him last week, you know, my cribbage playing father-in-law. He sent me cribbage pegs, by the way. What ironically. <laughs> remember I talked about my father-in-law, how he's not saved, and he said that's not Christ-like the way I was playing cribbage with him. My wife comes back, guess what he sent? Unbeknownst, he didn't know I had mentioned him in the sermon, he sent me a set, a set of cribbage pegs. Nice, very nice, solid cribbage. I'm just like, oh my, how did the Lord know? How did he know? He's used by the Lord to get to me, to humble me, and to say, hey. And I'm like, okay, Lord, I get it. Okay, whoa, I think. I mean, I'm a little slow, right? But my mother-in-law, she's a beautiful saint. She writes Bible studies. She is a gifted, godly woman. And her husband is not saved. She picks up his socks. 
I used to go, when I went to seminary, I used to go and stay with her. I was her little prophet that came. She had a little bed for me. I'd stay with her. She was looking out the window one day. She goes, don't you ever just feel like leaving? She wanted to leave, Earl. And I said, oh, ministry time. I get to love on my mother-in-law. And we got to just talk about Jesus. And I got to minister to her and say, no, it's a beautiful picture of Christ when you're submissive to your husband and he's not a believer. There was a lot of tears in that because she was serious. She was ready to leave. And she submitted to him because she knew that in submitting even to an unbeliever, and he wasn't doing anything foul or sinful. He was just difficult to deal with. Takes his socks off, leaves them on the floor, like tells you how to do the dishes. I'm like, oh, you know how to do that, Earl? Here, come do it. Does that to me, and I say, Earl, maybe you should do the dishes if you're going to tell me how to do it. Anyway, that's another. Ah, oh, you know, he'll send me a dish. Um, <laughs> goodness gracious. Or a scrubby, scrubby, right? I can see it happening right now. Please don't tell Earl I said these things. Anyway, I love him, but he's not a believer. Anyway, anyway, that's my thorn in the side. Anyway, back, back on point, back on point. She submits to him. She submits to him up to a point, okay? She ties it to church. She's faithful. She sees her spiritual headship as a young man. He's less than, he's, he's 28 years old. He came out of RTS down in Sacramento. He's a godly young man. Came off the streets, was an IV drug user. You would never know it if you met this man. Whereas a tie, I mean, the man is just a pristine, well gifted man. And she goes to him for that headship, that spiritual headship. She goes to him and talks to him. And he's more than happy to care for her, knowing that she is a spiritual widow because her husband is not a believer. So she's covered with that. And it's a beautiful picture of what the church does for the widows and for those women who are unequally yoked. And that's how it happens. He's a beautiful, beautiful young man to her. I thank God for him too. I thank God for him. So that's some of the, how that works. But the beautiful picture, the beautiful picture is, you know, oh, I'm not going to submit to my husband because he's not being very Christ-like. No, that's not in the text. Can't find it anywhere. We submit just like Kathy does, you know. Well, I'm not going to care for my wife because she's, she's not submitting. Sorry, gentlemen. You're to care for her at all times. You're not to have a contingency that says, unless she fulfills her role, I won't do my role. It doesn't exist in Scripture anywhere. Anyway, if you look through some of the texts of Scripture there, it goes through the sections of Genesis uh, in that man's role and his responsibility, and that is a problem in the church too. I don't think a lot of the men understand that when they just step aside and allow their wives to do the work that they're supposed to do, that they actually are being used to distort their role, their own role and their wife's role. Because if you step out of the way, what are they going to do? The women are going to step up and they're going to take care of those things that aren't getting done. So this lecture also would go for the men of the church. Not yet. (laughs) Yeah, you're like, yeah! Just stop right here and go take care of them guys and everything will be just fine, right? So the women's role, if you look on page three, page number B, the thing that distinguishes the woman is that she was a helper, suitable for the man. There's only one thing that wasn't good in the garden, and that was when God looked at Adam and said, it's not good, it's not good for the man to be alone. He says, I will create you a helper, suitable, suitable for what you need. Ladies, when you're married to your husband, guess what? He needed you. Everything you possess, all your attributes, all your qualities, all your talents, all you, everything you have, your husband was lacking. Everything you were lacking, he is. When you come together, you're a beautiful picture of unity. He created man, both male and female. There's two portions to the man. If you're a young lady here and you're not married yet, great. You're married to, the, to Christ and you don't have any distractions. The rest of us, we've taken a lesser point, right? We're distracted all the time. Because we have to keep one another. You know, I have to keep my wife happy. She has to keep me happy. So we're distracted at all the times. But young ladies in the church, celibacy is a beautiful, beautiful picture because you're married to Christ. There's no distractions. You can fully serve Christ on that regard. I just wanted to make a mention of that. But women's roles. In the word helper, we have a, a beautiful womanhood that, is, that it means to be feminine. What it means to be feminine is to be a helper. In the Garden of Eden, Adam lost a rib, not a foot bone, not a head bone. He lost a rib bone. Okay, And it was the rib that he was able to read his wife's mind with. So guess what, ladies? You've got to talk to your husbands and tell them what you want in some way, shape, or form. So communication. But the rib, rib protects the most vital organs of the man. You're to stand beside your husband, protecting his affections. And if the men were here, I would be telling them the very same thing. 
The, the wife that you have is supposed to be what you consider precious. She protects your affections. Your affections are to be to her and none other. You're to be a one-woman man, and you women are to be a, a one-man woman. That's what it is. That's the beautiful picture of Christ. Does Christ have two churches that he's married to? Does he have two brides? Nope. We'll discount all the other issues of life, but for this moment right now, we need to see the beautiful, beautiful covenant of marriage and the beautiful picture that's there for us. But a helper. So he's supposed to be the head. The woman is supposed to be the helper. He's the leader. He's the private. He's the perfecter. I like Vodi Bauckham who says men are supposed to be four things for their wives. The four P's. He's supposed to be a priest, a prophet, a protector, and a provider. Let me clarify those really quick so we don't have a misunderstanding about priest and prophet. Um, what does a prophet do? He brings the word to the wife. A prophet is someone who brought the word of God to his wife. A priest takes those needs of his wife to God. Protects her. Make sure that she has everything she needs and provides for her. There's a protection that the man is supposed to supply. He's supposed to be the one taking those darts, those arrows. And he's supposed to provide. Now, here's the problem that we have in society, and I would, the men maybe will listen to this. Too many men want to just go out and be the provider, don't they? Want to go out, do a job, come home, and they're done. And all the other things get left by the wayside. And then women are left with nothing, and they need something, and they have to find it somewhere else. And so, again, we find these problems within the church. So, yeah, I would give this lecture to the men also, but with more prominence. But the women's role, the women's role, you read through this. And, by the way, I'm not going to go through all of this. This is for your edification, these 13 pages. And there is going to be a questionnaire at the end that you're going to have to take home and fill out for me and give it back to me because I want to know what your thinking is. But also there's a questionnaire to find out what your talents are, what your desires are in women's ministry. So I'll give you that at the end. But I'm not going to read through all of these, but I would tell you right now, you need to read through these, okay? There's a gifted man who put all this together, and I'm not going to have time to read through all of these. So how does a woman relate to a man as his helper? If you look down there, it's uh, underlined. God created her for the purpose of providing Adam with a helper. Thus, she would be under his authority, yet our text at the same time, when you're talking about the Genesis text, also emphasizes that Eve does not help Adam as one inferior to him. She is not his slave, servant, or a doormat. Rather, she is a helper suitable for him. She's not over his head. She's not under his foot. She's along his side. That's where you're supposed to be. And if there's a problem with that, I will talk to your husbands, but I don't think that's going to be a problem right now. Page four. Suitable. A woman is a suitable helper. Look where it's underlined there. What an awesome God to think of such a thing. He is the one who created us male and female. Our world insists there is no difference between men and women. God says, no, there is a beauty in my design. God made this. This is God's design. It reflects him and glorifies him. The design of the covenant of marriage, the design of a biblical womanhood and biblical manhood is what glorifies him. Therefore, it is under attack. We need to realize that. Number two there says, one main sphere of being a helper is in the home. We see that this first hinted at in chapter chapter three of the woman's sphere of influence in the curse in Genesis 3.16. God designed her to nurture and to raise children and to be a help to her husband. This is affirmed in the New Testament where women are called to be workers at home in Titus 2, 4 through 5 and to keep house in 1 Timothy 5, 14. Literally to manage the household of another. What a high calling. Look at the reference that I put in there for you. That's mine. Joseph was a keeper of Pharaoh's house in Genesis 41, 40. Pharaoh was put in charge of the house. Okay, now your husband can say you need to be the keeper of the house or a housekeeper. Which would you prefer to be? How many of you like being housekeepers or a keeper of the house? Big difference, isn't there? Housekeeper is a servant who comes in and does the bidding of the one who owns the house. A keeper of the house is much different. Pharaoh had Joseph as a keeper of his house, and that's what you're to be, a keeper of the house. That means you work alongside of your husband. You're to keep the house. You're to honor him. Who got the honor, Joseph or Pharaoh? Pharaoh did. Pharaoh was the one who was in charge, but he was, he was the second guy in the town was Joseph. Joseph was the keeper of his house. What a high calling. Think about what wives do. They, they, they go out and get all the food, make sure the meals are ready, make sure everything's coordinated. They're a nurse. They're a psychotherapist if they have boys in the house. Or if they have girls, they're a drama agent. Uh, they have to coordinate calendars. They have to budget 
everything that they have. If you were to take all those in the, in the common culture today and put those all together at a salary rate, you'd be paying you women probably $500,000 a year. Don't go ask for a raise from your husbands. But when you think about what women do as a keeper of the home, it's a high calling. But what does the world do to that? The world puts that down. You ladies need to lift that up. Say, this is a high calling. This is a high calling that God has given to you. A keeper of the home. And your husband's supposed to be honored in that. He's supposed to be the one who seeks the honor in that. So the glory of being a helper is articulated there in number three. So our greatest joy is found, the last sentence there, our greatest joy is found when we carry out our roles as God intended, as God intended these things to be. Let's go to page five. The fall. In Genesis 3, the devil desires, desire was to get mankind to rebel against God. How did he go about doing that? He tricked the woman. He tricked her. She took of its fruit and ate, and she gave also to her husband who was with her, and he ate. That is being played out every single day. Every single day. The battle of the sexes started in Genesis 3. Did you ladies know that? It started right there. So she took its fruit, and she ate, and she gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate. The text emphasizes that the woman took the lead. She ate. Then she gave to her husband to eat. In other words, she usurped the man's role of headship. Who tempted her to do that? Satan. So if we find ourselves in that situation, who's ultimately tempting us to do that? Satan, the devil. Now, I made you guys scones, so you'd be happy at this point, but I'm just telling you, this is the truth of Scripture. You need to fight against it. You need to fight against it. When you take the lead, Satan is in the mix. He's not working through you. You're not being possessed, but he is the one who's tempting that to happen. Let's continue on that sentence. It says, she took the man's role and led him. The text also stresses that the man was with her. The man, in other words, sat passively by, allowing the deception to progress without, de- without decisive intervention. The woman was deceived by the devil into sinning. Adam was not deceived. He rebelled and forsook his responsibility. It was his responsibility. He stepped aside and she got hit. Are men willing to die for their wives? That doesn't mean you throw your, the men don't throw themselves in front of a bus for you, ladies. It means they take the arrows. They're supposed to stand in front of those things. You need to listen to them. They need to be discerning above good and evil. So he abandoned his post as head. The emphasis of Genesis 3, then, is that the role reversal was the means used to bring about the fall of the human race. Not only was it re- rebellion against God, but they set aside the divinely appointed order of male and female Eve stepped out of her role, Adam stepped out of his role, and it led to great misery and heartache. As God's people, we must not go on repeating the same mistakes. We can't keep repeating those things. So God pronounced the judgment. Again, I already covered that and told you. Essentially that the roles of helper and head were cursed. Their roles were cursed, not them individually. Their roles were cursed. And hence the situation we find ourselves in today. Page 6, it says, In Christ, the biblical roles of male and female are graciously restored. This is what we focus on. This is the gospel. Christ restores these things for us. The New Testament teaches the loving headship of man and the respectful submission of the woman. These roles are emphasized both in the home and in the church. So sometimes we just say it needs to be in the home, but it needs to be in the church as well. Look where it's underlined right there. Because of the curse, a woman's sinful tendencies will be will be to reject her God-given role. But through Christ, a godly woman is enabled to carry out her role of being a helper. Thus, the New Testament commands women who are married to submit and respect to their husbands, love their husbands, and be a one-man woman. They are also commanded to bear children, bring up their children, to love their children, to keep house, and be workers at home. Underlined section there, I want to read that after Titus 5. It says, through the power of the Holy Spirit, a woman is able to do this and finds great delight in Christ when she does. In the church, women are only restricted from one thing, teaching and leading men, 1 Timothy 2, 11 and following. Apart from this one restriction, 
Women have many opportunities to express their womanly inclination of being a helper, showing hospitality, serving others, assisting those in distress, being devoted to every good work, and teaching children. Older godly women have the responsibility to model and teach the younger women biblical femininity. Titus 2, 3 through 5. The woman was created to be a helper and a life giver. Through Christ, she is able to do this for her own joy and his glory. Mark that. His jo- your joy and his glory. Thus, the emphasis of the New Testament teaching on the role of women is on recovering what was lost in the fall. Through Christ, a woman can find the joy of biblical womanhood. Now, some people say, are you limiting us? Oh, pastor, No. One thing you women can't do is that's to teach men and to exercise authority over them. That's it. Everything else you can do. Everything else. Everything else that we're instructed in Scripture to do, you're able to do. Can you sin? Well, you do that anyway. I don't have to encourage you to do that. Not necessarily. You can do anything but those, that one thing. Teach or exercise authority. It's really one thing because it's the role of the elders of the church. It's that role to teach or exercise authority over men. Everything else you can do. That's a joyful thing. You should go, woo, we can do anything else. We can do what we want. We could this and that and that and this. It's like, yes, please do. We don't want to limit the women of the church. We want to say, please be godly women. Show the other women of the church what it means to be biblical women. Womanhood needs to be lifted up. The world is trouncing on it. It's absolutely trouncing on women. And they think they're being freed. That's the thing about feminism. If you read that, they're truly, they're going into bondage and they don't know it. They think feminism and all these things that they're fighting for these rights are actually a freedom for them. It's actually putting them in bondage. It's a deception. It's got to be from the devil. So the role of godly women in the church. Look at the bottom of page six. The character and ministry of godly women. Let's look at that section right there. Turn with me to 1 Timothy 5, 9 through 10. Let's just take a look at that. We talked about the young ladies. We talked about wives. What about our widows that are... Widows in the church, how do we regard them? A widow is to be put on the list only if she is less than 60 years, or not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. So what is, what is lined out there for us? This is the model. They just, Timothy has just been shown, this is the model. These are the godly women you want the younger women following. These are the women that I want my girls over, my girl, my daughter, to follow after. What have they done? Look at what they've done. They've had one husband, one man, having a reputation for good works, basically a one man at a time, having a reputation for good works, and if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, I don't need my feet washed, don't worry. If she has assisted those in distress and if she has devoted herself to every good work, these are the things that are attractive in the church. These are the things that we need to focus on. There's a list of ministries right there. But please don't wash anybody's feet right now, okay? Alan just came in and I don't think we're going to wash Alan's feet. Did you guys all see Alan came in? Young man came off the street looking for a church. So I gave him some scones and sent him on his way. He'll be back tomorrow, we hope. I don't expect anybody to wash his feet. You can wash my feet? No. But look at the beautiful picture here. This is a lady of reputation. This is a lady who has led. This is an older lady that we want the younger ladies emulating. We need to have these ladies in the church. These ladies need to make themselves available. And we also need to encourage the younger ladies to go to those older ladies. It was told to me one time, a young man said to me, he goes, the, the pastor's not available. He's just big and gruff and everything else. I said, have you talked to him? I can't, he's not approachable. It kind of broke my heart. And it wasn't me. It was a long time ago. But the young man said, the pastor's not approachable. He's big and growly and gruff and that shouldn't be the case. So I've encouraged men in the church. Men, are you available for the young men of the church? They need models. They need a model. What does it mean to be a biblical man? What does manhood look like? How do they understand? How do they grow up knowing what biblical manhood is if you're not available? Older men in the church, if you're not available for those younger men. Because they won't come to you unless you're available for them. Take them fishing. Do something. Show them how to fish. Anything. I used to use, by the way, I used to use the other men of the church for my sons because my sons wouldn't listen to me. So I would get other men of the church to kind of, I'd say, hey, can you go over and talk to my son a little bit? Because he won't listen to a word I'm saying. But I know you're going to tell him the exact same thing. And when you tell him, he'll listen to you. Guess what happened? 
exactly that. This guy, I, Brent Seymour was one of them. There was other men in the church. I said, hey, can you just go talk to my sons? Oh, dad, you know, Brent told me this. And I'm sitting there just going, I've been telling you that for years. But when he told him, it was golden. It's like, oh, this is great. This is, he, he's, a, he's a wise man. And I went. So me and Brent, we just go off and laugh and drink coffee, you know. Like, Seriously? I said the same thing. We need that in the church. These young ladies need somebody else. Mom's going to tell them to do something. They're going to go begrudgingly do it. They need older ladies in the church to say, hey. Don't say your mom's right, by the way, ladies. Don't say, oh, your mom's right, because then they'll just shut you down. To say, well, let's talk about that. And you'll see a beautiful picture. Beautiful godly women in the church. And that's what we see there in in Titus 5, 9 9 through 10. And the the rest of that section, all the way down to verse 17, we see what it looks like for an older godly woman. We We need to hold that up in the church. That's something that we need to model for the younger ladies in the church. We need to look at that and say, here's what a woman who has gotten past all the things, she's older in the church, she's a beautiful picture of what we want the next generation to be. How did she go about doing that? What are the things that she experienced along the way? How rough was it being married to a man who took his socks off and left him in the living room night after night after night? That's what Earl does. <laughs> so anyway, takes his socks off and just leaves them there. She picks them up, puts them in the wash. I'm like, I would never do that. I, wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't pick up the socks. I might put, take my socks off, but I wouldn't pick them up. Anyway, she's just a beautiful picture of, of what an older woman should be. I admire her for that. I hope that she doesn't get burnt out. So the role of godly women in the church. Let's move on. So look at where it says the model of ministry and of godly women there. Oh, I want to read that other section. Everything that's underlined is, by the way, emphasis. I want you to make sure you pay close attention to. So the paragraph that's underlined says, you will notice that all the things listed about this godly woman are relational. This is talking about the woman in 1 Timothy 9 and 10. Relational, how she relates to her husband, children, and others. You guys were relational this morning? You spent about a half an hour relating to each other, didn't you? I was upstairs making copies, and I looked down here, and you guys were just having a great time, just talking, talking. I go, they're fine. They're getting their 40,000 words out. This is great. Women are naturally relational, aren't they? Men are not so relational. We need need like 40 words a day, and women need 40,000, right? So women are just naturally relational. You're also nurturing. You have have a a spiritual motherly gift. You nurture. You naturally nurture. My daughter, she has a rabbit. She naturally nurtures that rabbit. And the cat, she just treats like a little baby. And I'm like, what is she doing with that poor cat? He was trained, though. The thing was, he's trained from the beginning, so he doesn't scratch her. He just, he just accepts it. And I'm just like, he's a wacky kitty. Anyway, look at this. She's relational with her husband, with her children, with others. She, has a rela- she was a relational woman. She does not simply know the Bible or teach it. She lives it out. But you got to know it first to live it out. Ladies, you gotta know your you gotta know the word. So when you're having these relationships and you're going out fishing with the young ladies, hopefully you're talking about well, maybe you're not fishing, maybe you're doing diapers or laundry or whatever it is. But you gotta know your Bible, lady, baby, ladies, ladies, you gotta know your Bible so you can teach it to them. But you also have to live it out. The word of God needs to be permeating from you. And remember, that's what's attractive to God. That quiet and gentle spirit, but there's that permeation of, of Christ. There's that permeation of the word of God. It's got to be there. The woman who does this will gain a reputation as a woman of excellence. It is also clear from this list of qualifications that the woman who meets them would be of immeasurable value to the church. Paul is envisioning an older woman who becomes a model for younger women. Godly women can have a great impact in the kingdom of God. Not just the church. Look what it says there, the kingdom of God. Christ is building his church. We are the tools that he uses much of the time. How are we making ourselves available to that? Then there's a section there on Titus 2. Let's turn there real quick. Turn with me to Titus 2. Let me just read that little section for you. Because this is a focus that we need to have. In Titus 2, beginning at verse 1, it says, But as for you... Speak things which are fitting for sound doctrine. Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, in perseverance. Now, the reason I read that is because the next section is a likewise statement. It says, older women likewise. So those things that Paul is telling Titus that need to be recognized in the men of the church, the older men, also in addition to those things, these are the things that older women are to exemplify. 
are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips. Ooh, that's a scary one. Remember, that's Diablos. Uh, Not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Did you guys catch the last line? The first section, verse 3, is the model. And then there's the, the actual mode of that. And then the last line, though, is your motivation. So that. That's a hint clause. That's a purpose clause. How many of you like to know what the will of God is? I hope everybody just raise your hands. Y'all like to want, I want to do the will of God. What's the will of God? Please, pastor, show me the will of God. I'm about to. So that the word of God will, be, will not be dishonored. How do you do that? You follow what just came before that. It says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior. You're to be reverent, fearing God in what you do. Not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good. You can only teach if you're a student. The only way you can be a teacher is to be a student. So that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands because they love their husbands, to love their children because they love their children, to be sensible because they're sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. The word of God is what's in store there. The motivation is so that God's word is honored. Do you guys understand that? You're doing this for whose honor? Your husband's. For the elders of the church. So that the word of God is not dishonored. So that God's word is honored. How do you honor God's word? It's on the questionnaire. You'll figure it out. How do we honor God's word? Read it. Pray through it. Meditate memorize. It's got to be a part of your life. It's got to be a part of our every day. We've got to read books, good theological works. These are just a, a smattering, but there are books out there that we need to put ourselves under the counsel of. So summary, last page, or actually it's not the last page because I'm going to leave you some of the other stuff to read. Page eight, summary. We have seen in this smattering of a few verses and in the, in the text that I hope that you will all read and it will take this to heart. For study of the Bible, we have seen that God created man, men, and women equal yet different. Have you ever realized that, right? You guys know that you're different from the men, right? They would come in here, they'd be smelly right now. Equal in their standing before God, equal in their nature, yet God in his wisdom created them different. He made them man, the head, and the leader, and he made the woman the suitable helper. Those roles carry over into the church, to the church. Wise, godly men are to be the spiritual leaders and teachers of the church. Wise, godly women are to support the leadership of the men and teach the younger women. The implication of this model are that the elders of the church are responsible to oversee the women's ministry. The elders are to give a vision with the input of the older godly women. That's my role. I was assigned that a year and a half ago. I'm sorry it took me this long to encourage you. Biblical womanhood is something that we need to fight for in the church. As Kim said, are you going to have a talk with the men? Hopefully they've been listening because they're, they're scared at home right now. They're going to watch the video later because they'll have to be accountable to these things. Well, you see down there the objectives of women's ministries. The primary objective, women's ministry fits into the overall mission of the church. What we need to think about is whatever women's ministries do, how does it fit in the church? How many of you know the body illustration of the church? If I were to say, I'm just going to go do this ministry, and I cut my arm off, and I throw it over there to the side and say, this is just going to be over there, and then somebody wants to do another ministry and cut this arm off and throw it over there, it's going to be a little hard for the body to work, isn't it? We need to have one unified statement, one vision, one mission for the church. You'll see there's a couple of mentions in the notes of that. We'll work on that, but we need to have a vision and a mission for women's ministries that's in line with the vision ministry of the church. What will bring us together? What will bring us unified if we're all focused on one thing? For me right now, it's the exaltation of Christ to the glory of God the Father empowered by the Spirit. That's just a very general little vision statement that I can put on any ministry and say, how is your ministry, whatever you're doing, doing that? How is what you're doing exalting Christ for the glory of God empowered by the Spirit. That's, just, that's a nice just little simple thing. Hopefully we'll expand on that. And there is a statement in there, by the way. You guys got to look for it. 
There's a statement in there about a vision statement for women's ministries. See, if you find it, I'd like to have your input on it on the questionnaire. But you have to be reading. See, this will make sure that you guys read the notes. Because you've got to answer the questionnaire. So I got some things in there, sorry. That's just mean, right? I'm, I'm doing this for your betterment and for the church's betterment. So that there's not an arm laying over here and there's not an arm laying over here. But the, the, the body of the church works together. Okay, we have to be unified in the ministries of the church, fixed and focused and working together. So evangelism, look at page nine. The areas that we can look at, evangelism, nurturing and discipleship, serving, engaging the next generation. Is there, is there what you're doing? Are you engaging the next generation? Are you thinking about how am I bringing people into this ministry that I'm doing in the church so that I can evangelize others? How am I inviting other people that don't know the Lord to come into this? And how am I making a, the intention? How many of you ever heard the word Intentionality. We need to be intentional with our ministries. Intentional for gospel evangelism, for discipleship, for nurturing. All the things you see there on that page, on page nine, those are things that we need to be thinking about. But if we don't think about them, they won't happen. If we just do ministries and don't think about how we are trying to reach people and being intentional about it, it will not happen. It just won't. We think, oh, it'll just happen by osmosis. People will encounter us and we'll tell them the gospel. No, we have to be intentional. We have to be targeted about these things. We really do. We have to think, how is this ministry, that whatever it is, uh, let's just take for example, one example, um, Christmas time, Christmas ornament exchange. How can I invite somebody who doesn't know the gospel into that ministry and think about, how am I going to present the gospel to them? It's intentional. You're thinking. You're thinking ahead of time. How am I going to target this person with the evangelical thing? And how am I then going to disciple somebody else to show them how to do it? Disciple making, disciple makers. How are you now discipling somebody? If you're in a ministry right now, who are you discipling? You're all thinking, uh, I'm just doing this because I need to get it done. That's good, except who is beside you? Paul always had somebody beside him. There was discipleship all the time in the church. Who are you discipling? Who is coming alongside of you so that you can train them how to do it? Making disciple, making disciple makers. Is that a tongue twister? That's what, it, well, that's what Jesus was getting to when he said, go and make disciples of every tribe, tongue, nation, and group. He was talking about making disciple, making disciple makers. Making, disciple, making, disciple, making. You can disciple someone, but if you disciple them so that they know how to disciple someone else, then they can disciple someone else, so they can disciple someone else. Did I say disciple too many times? That's the thing. That's how the church grows. If the church is not doing discipleship, we will, we will close the doors. The church will close its doors if we're not making disciples. But making disciples who know how to make another disciple is the goal of every ministry. It should be one of the goals of every ministry. So that page goes on to just talk about some generalities there. On to page 10. It says, the structure of GBC's women's ministries, a practical example. Overseen by the elders. And there's different aspects of that. We'll talk about it some other time on the questionnaire. Principles for women leading women in that section there. There's character. There's conviction. For the leaders, I want you just to read through that. That's all structural, practical things that you can read through on your own. And on to page 12 where it says the qualifications of teachers and leaders in the church. The elders need to be looking for these things. A lot of what we look for in the church are, are women who are already seeking to learn. Women who are already doing things. We recognize those things and we say, hey, it looks as though you have the ability to do something because you're already seeking to do it. Can you please disciple someone else? So the elders are actually recognizing giftings that people have. We're saying, hey, who are you discipling? Can we bring something else alongside of you? So as you look at those last three pages, 10, 11, and 12, think about those things. How are you doing those things? Then on page 13, there's four books up on the top there I already mentioned to you. But those are excellent, excellent books for you to get our heads wrapped around a biblical view of womanhood to help us to do that. How many of you need help doing this? I need to, because guess what? I'm the one who's in charge of you ladies. <laughs> You're all like, great. <laughs> what does he know about being a woman? <laughs> Nothing. All I know is what the Bible says. And I know what's attractive. Anyway, I was, like I said, I was assigned to women's ministries because the other elders of the church were scared of you all. You guys don't look scary. <laughs> You don't look scary. You really don't. But Chris is up there. Chris is up there with his shotgun going, if you need my, yeah. So Chris is my backup. Anyway, and that's a sad thing. That's a sad thing. Because when Phil told when Phil told me that, I just I was sad. 
I was really sad. I'm like, what do you mean you're afraid of your women in your church? He goes, a lot of pastors are afraid of the women in the church. So they just, they just leave them alone. And then the women are left to figure it out on their own. That is a horrible place for the women's ministries of the churches to be. But that's, that's lock and stock a lot of the problem in the churches today is that the women are just left to do it on, figure it out on your own. Figure out good books on your own. Do whatever you want to do. Just go find a book. I don't care. Just David C., whatever the free book is of the month. Okay, grab it. Do a Bible study. Oh, no, no. Like I said, there are snakes in those books. So that's why I've got four books here. I got some, I, there are some good books out there. I've got, and these aren't just because I've read them. I don't read most of my books. I read about half of them and stick a bookmark in it and then give them to somebody and say, can you read this? Tell me what it's about. It works really well until you figure out what I've done to you. Um, but I know a lot of guys who endorse these. Legan Duncan, Susan Hunt. I know this guy. I know he's solid. So I can endorse him. And then you look at the back. Who else is endorsing them? So I want to encourage you women uh, that there is help for you out there. We need to be on the same page. And remember what's attractive to our Lord. Let me just close with this. First Peter, again, we're right back to where I started. Don't you want to be precious in the sight of God, ladies? Don't you want God to say, I find you precious and attractive. I'm not letting you go. He says, this is it right here. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. What a thing to think about. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, it lives it out. It comes out of you. Your adornment must not merely be external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry. Do those things, it's good. Or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart. The hidden person of the heart with an imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. Oh, ladies, please, if you haven't tattooed that on your forehead, do so now. I'm just kidding. No tattoos. But think about that. Meditate on that. Memorize that. Just cherish that. This is precious in the sight of God. The imperishable qualities. There's, they won't perish. They never go away. Quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. For in this way, in the former times, the holy women, holy women, they were holy, set aside, set apart. They were other. These are other. They weren't conformed to the world. They were conformed to Christ. Holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves. This is what they wore day in and day out. This was their pajamas. This was their fine dress. This was their common dress. This is how they adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. Please take that one section and just love that. That's precious. Susan, yes. I do, because it's noon, and I'll get killed if I go 10 minutes over. Oppression. Mm-hmm. So just just to make sure that, that we have a robust understanding of what what that means, what true means and where that comes from. Where does that come from? Yeah, David had the heart of a shepherd, right? He David had a heart after God's own heart. He was a shepherd, right? That's right. Yeah. So there's, there's a really good it's a balance. No, we're not saying that you're. We're not saying that you're. You're. You're having to be committed to an, uh, the the silence thing that you were under, yeah. whatever. That <laughs> anyway, she has an interesting interesting story, but it's not like the church is saying, "Be quiet." Yeah. No. Right. Remember, I said there's only one thing you can't do: teach or exercise authority over man. So I'm not telling you that you got to keep your mouth shut. I'm not saying that. 
There's only one thing you can't do. Teach and exercise authority over man. Everything else you can do with, with what? Joy. Joy in the Lord. Joy in Christ. Where does your joy come from? It comes from him. It doesn't come from your husband. Dan's a good guy, but it doesn't come from him. You know, I get to talk from my... Anyway, it comes from Christ. It comes from God. right? And yeah, there's, there's much more to be said about a quiet and gentle spirit. It's, but it's not an oppressive thing. It's a joyful thing. You need to be thinking, I'm doing this because I have a joy in the Lord, right? And I've told other people at this church, I said, if you're doing something and you feel compelled to do it, if you feel you have to do this, please stop. There should be a joy in it. You're doing this to, for a joy in the Lord. Do it because you have a joy in the Lord. You're, you love Christ. You love the church because Paul loved the church, not because of who they were, because he saw the blood that was poured out on them. He saw the love that Christ had for the church. That's why he loved the church, because he's going, you guys are a bunch of knuckleheads. Just read First Corinthians. He loved the church. Paul loved the church because he saw God's love on the church. That was his joy. That's my joy. Because you guys are a bunch of knuckleheads. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I say that to the men. Sorry, that's the, that's the follow-up to the men's conference that will be tomorrow. Kim. No, that's a that's a that's a service ministry. So you're, you're t- we're talking we're talking about like what what elders do basically in the church. So you know I have no problem with men or with women having the responsibility and the authority. If, if we give you the responsibility, you have the authority. So when you're given the responsibility over a task team in the kitchen, you have the authority. And if men are there, yeah. And, and I would say that that is that is not the case uh, as as far as violating that text at all. You know you've been given that responsibility, and so you have the authority. Men come to you and ask you what to do. Yeah. No problem. Uh, my wife says, can you please wipe the island every night and make it clean? I, I, yeah, I serve her. There's a service aspect, too. It's not violated. When we talk about authority, there's like the governing of the church, the roles of the church. So there's a completely different aspect there. So service is a different thing. So you're not violating that at all. Um, if you were, we would put a man in charge of that. But anyway. And that, so if the, if the men were here right now, I would say, men, before you go to work, have you said to your wives, do you have everything you need today to flourish? That's what it means to be a provider. You ask your wife, you, you come to her. Now, please don't take these things home and throw those on your husband because they haven't heard any, anything I've said. And they're like, what are you talking about? Where do you find that in the Bible? Anyway, the husband should say before he walks out the door to work, he should say, do you have everything you need to flourish today, to grow you have what you need. Have I, have I washed you with the hearing of the water of the word? Is everything you need, is there, is there money in the checking account? Do you have everything you need today to flourish, to grow? That's the man's responsibility. That's what it means to die to self, not to throw yourself under a bus for your wife. It means you make sure she has everything she needs day by day by day. You provide for her. And so that's a question I usually ask my wife when I run out the door. You got everything you need today? Well, I want to be late, so. Maybe at some point in time. But just think about that, please, ladies. I, I, I've given you the notes. I didn't go through all of them, and I very much so jumped over all of a lot of, a lot of good things in here, okay? There's some things I'd really like you to take to heart. So please read the notes. I didn't make them for you to burn me at the stake with, okay? Anyway, I made these for you guys just for edification. I made these so you guys would read through them, meditate on them, and I have a questionnaire I'll hand out to you as you're leaving here to just know your abilities and your talents, your concerns, what things you think women's ministry should be doing. And guess what? It's blank on the back, so you can add more if you want. But there's some questions on here I want you to look at. I want you to talk. I want you to look through. It'd be best, too, if you read the, the notes in, incomplete and then answered the questionnaire and hand this back to me, okay? And then we'll go from there. You guys still hungry? I got more scones. Anyway, thank you for your patience. I hope to be faithful to what I need to do to oversee and to encourage you and to give you the equipment, again, that I can say to you, do you have everything you need to flourish in women's ministries? I hope that we're starting with this and we'll grow together in that, okay? So please, help me because I'm afraid of you too. (laughs) That's good. good, Fear is a good thing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for our Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the one who is the shepherd and guardian of our souls. Father, I hope that every heart in this room right now wants to understand how we go about ministry 
for the glory, for the exaltation of Christ, for your glory, empowered by your spirit, Father. Help that to be something that we ruminate on. We tell ourselves each day, how am I bringing you glory? How can I step back from this and say, thank you, God, for what you've given to me. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you, Father, for how you've given me a ministry to bring Christ to bear on my life and upon the lives of those around me. So, Father, please help us to know how to do that. We need your guidance. We need your wisdom and your counsel. We need your spirit. And we need a great, beautiful picture of your son. And all that we do, may it be for your glory. Bless these women, Father. Give them a clear picture of biblical womanhood so that they can encourage the next generation and so that they can fight the war that is before them. Equip them, strengthen them, Father, please. Give them what they need so that they can glorify you and that they would be precious in your sight. Thank you for them, and I ask your blessing upon them in Jesus' name. Amen.